nice time, and uh, it's nice to see so many of you here. Um, I'm going to present a paper called Safe Wrappers and uh, Sane Policies for Self-Protecting JavaScript. And it's a joint uh, work with uh, Fu Fung and uh, David Sands. And it's uh, a continuation of their work on the lightweight self-protecting JavaScript. So lightweight self-protecting JavaScript uh, is an um, approach to uh, mitigate um, uh, cross-site scripting <coughs> by, uh, by giving, so I'll briefly explain it. So uh, we have a number of built-ins in the browser and uh, the window object points to those uh, built-in me me methods. So what uh, they, their approach is is to uh, use aspect-oriented pro uh, programming um, techniques to wrap the built-ins. So you create wrappers uh, that uh, will enforce some policy before executing the built-in and uh, redirect uh, the, uh, the pointer to the wrapper instead of uh, the, uh, to the built-in directly. So whenever we try to execute alert, what we will actually execute is the wrapper, which will then, if the policy agrees with it, uh, execute the uh, built-in. And the main point here is that the uh, wrapper will hold a unique reference to the built-in. So even though a malicious uh, application uh, or a cross-site scripting attempt to redir um, redirects the reference uh, to alert to a, ma a malicious alert, they still won't be able to re uh, obtain the functionality because it can't get access to the, uh, to the reference inside the wrapper. So we have uh, uh, behavioral sandboxing in the sense that the behavior of the browser is uh, sandboxed uh, rather than, um, than, um, than uh, for example, the uh, DOM tree or uh, something like that. And uh, we only wrap built-ins because they are the foundations upon which the user scripts are built. So they provide the functionality to user script and uh, if it's uh, uh, wrapped or if we can control the behavior then we can mitigate whatever whatever code is executing we can control it so and this is um, uh, it has to be executed the first thing so the uh, the wrapper has to uh, be um, or the, the built-ins has to be wrapped, the first thing, because as soon as user code executes, we really do not have any um, control over what happens to the environment that we are going to wrap. So uh, it could be redirected to a malicious alert be before um, uh, we wrap, and then uh, we will have lost the, the whole point of uh, wrapping. So as long as we make sure that it executes the first thing that, ha that happens in the page load, then we can control the behavior. And uh, this is lightweight in the sense that we don't need to analyze the code, we don't need to transform the code, we just make sure everything's wrapped and then we have control. So the library uh, or well, so the lightweight self-protecting JavaScript consists of a wrapping library that provides the functionality of wrap, wrapping built-ins and some policies um, which, uh, which uh, em enforce the behavior. And the policy code is site-specific, so we uh, can have multiple or we will have different policies for different sites. One site might allow alert to be executed five times, and another site might not uh, uh, care at all about if alert is executed or not. So when I started uh, looking at this uh, wrapping library and uh, these policies, I found some 
uh, some um, attacks, both uh, actually on the wrapping library itself, how it was, how it uh, performed the wrapping, and um, and in the policy code, or some uh, problems that affect the policy code, uh, and uh, that that is uh, basically what the paper is about, and uh, what I will be presenting today. So, when it comes to the wrapper, three types of uh, attacks um, were found. And uh, together we have uh, discussed and uh, came up with solutions uh, to these attacks. So the first uh, one, function and object subversion. So a function instance, for example, or any object actually, uh, will inherit from uh, its prototype chain. So a call to apply of a function will actually uh, call uh, look up uh, the prototype chain until it finds apply and execute that apply method. But if we modify that apply, then we also modify the behavior, how it behaves for the function instance. And uh, that is something that is accessible to the user code after wrapping the, the function itself. So, so what we found was that uh, at one place in the wrapper code we had, uh, we uh, ran apply on the original function, on the original built-in. So by, uh, by modifying the pro prototype of, um, of the function object, um, so re redirecting the apply function to mean something else, then we could capture the original built-in by, um, by um, as it was executed. So a fix for this is uh, simply to make sure that the original apply is actually the uh, up, uh, original apply fi function that we uh, were expecting in the beginning, the, um, the unmodified version. Another problem, global setter subversion. So we have a function closure, and inside this closure we have a, a variable. Uh, we create an object and assign it to a variable. And this is supposed to be inaccessible from the outside. It's supposed to be a, a contained it's supposed to be contained inside the function scope and uh, not be, uh, be able to leak outside. But um, in some browsers, we have global setters. So we can define a setter that, um, that will be uh, uh, in effect for every object. And especially, it will be executed upon instantiation of objects. So when we actually create this object over here, the setter will be executed and we can steal the secret. In the uh, wrapping code at one point we created a temporary object just to pass to the policy which contained uh, the original built-in and by defining this uh, setter for, uh, for, um, um, for a field in that object then you could steal uh, the original built-in back. So, um, so one way of fixing the wrapper would be to not allow a temporary object, which might work in the wrapper code, yes. Um, we can make sure that we don't create any temporary objects. We pass uh, all the arguments as is and so on. But maybe in general it's not feasible. Another way would be to use safe objects, objects that do not inherit from, uh, uh, from uh, any setters or so on. And I'll talk more about uh, safe objects later on. And the third um, possibility would be to change JavaScript to not execute uh, setters upon instantiation. And that is actually what has happened uh, in uh, Firefox they do not long, uh, no longer execute any um, setters uh, upon object uh, instantiation. 
However, Chrome and Safari still does. Another problem is uh, an aliasing problem. So we have a built-in, the actual built-in uh, somewhere inside the browser, but we have a number of different aliases for this built-in. And uh, one of them will be passed uh, to the uh, wrapping code, um, to the library, and um, it might be that you just wrap that particular um, alias for this function. But what you actually want is to wrap the function itself. So regardless of which alias um, you use, so you will still use the, um, it will still point to the wrapped uh, object, the wrapped built-in or the, to the wrapper. Another problem with aliases is uh, dynamic aliases. So um, aliases that um, um, is created dynamically. Um, and so, for example, in uh, one browser, alert points to the built-in alert, and we add a wrapper to that and point it to the wrapper instead. Perfectly fine, but the co malicious code in this uh, page might create a new window, which has its own pointer to the built-in, and uh, then reassign alert to actually to the other window object uh, alert function, and restore the functionality that way. So these are all um, vulnerabilities or problems with wrapping or with the wrapper. Um, and um, dealing with this problem is actually ki uh, quite hard. And so far, the only solution that we've found, uh, even though we've, we've been working on it for quite some time and we have some ideas, uh, but the only solution so far is actually to not allow access to any other window object. So when it comes to policies, uh, in fact, we have the same problem for policies when it comes to function and object subversion, um, but it's even worse. So for a policy, uh, policies we cannot control. The wrapper we can, uh, can control. We know what the code will be. We know what will be, what, what we can, uh, how we can um, write a good wrapper so that it's not affected by this but the policies come from the policy writer. So uh, th someone else is writing the policies who might not know about these problems. So we need to write um, our wrapper in such a way that it uh, allows the, uh, the policy writer to use um, as much functionality as possible without having to know, in, in a safe way, without having to know all the vulnerabilities. So for example, in the policy, if we have a, a whitelist, uh, which consists of an object where um, uh, a domain name uh, is associated with true if it's in the whitelist. And uh, we do a lookup in the whitelist. Um, if uh, it's in the whitelist, uh, then it's okay to be, um, to be visited or some, uh, something like that. Uh, then uh, then it can be subverted by, uh, for example, creating um, a global, um, so a pro uh, property that is uh, associated with all objects, and that will be inherited by the whitelist, so that evil.com is also included in the whitelist. And another way, in this case, since we are using a built-in function, we can actually reassign the function to mean one thing uh, when it's um, uh, accessed in the whitelist and when it's actually l later on used in, uh, in the code, then it will return something else. So one fix for this would be to use the has local property. But again, that's something that the policy writer would have to know. So, um, he should 